First of all, uh, welcome to one and all. Zakmullah Khair for coming to this event. Obviously, these events uh, laid out for the benefit of all of the people. And Alhamdulillah, it's good to see that, mashallah, so many brothers and sisters have turned up for this event. We hope, inshallah, this won't be uh, you know, the first and the last, but inshallah, it'll be a series of events. We're very, very pleased to have our Ustad, uh, Amr <coughs> Tim, here. Mashallah, he studied at the Islamic University of Medina and graduated from the Faculty of Hadith. So I have a very strong link with him because I also studied in the Faculty of Hadith. And mashallah, being one of the few du'at, you know, learned du'at in the middle, in the, in this uh, northeast area, really, alhamdulillah, we should, inshallah, make him a regular, inshallah, uh, guest speaker at our venue, inshallah, bi'ithnillah ta'ala. And that's something that, inshallah, we want to make a priority, if he's, inshallah, willing, bi'ithnillah ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, there isn't much else to say except that, please, uh, we have to bear in mind that this is a majlis of ilm, of knowledge, so we have to sit and listen with the due respect and courtesy. I often find something which is, maybe we don't see as a problem, but this is uh, not, a, not a, a correct way to sit in a majlis of knowledge, and that's to stick your feet out and like recline back. That's incorrect. So we don't want to sit like that. Please, all of us sit in a way which, inshallah, befits a person who's seeking knowledge. Because at this moment in time, you've come here with the intention of seeking knowledge. And you hope to see with Allah the reward for that same action. So if you want the reward for that same action, then also we have to behave in the appropriate way. And also that, you know, it's not conducive for the speaker to be, inshallah, able to really address the issues and give you Mashallah, the vast amount of knowledge that he has gathered on that subject. So please bear this in mind. Dear little children, please keep them with you. We don't want anybody running up and down the stairs. If you're going to be bringing children, then they are responsible to keep them with you. As we said, Inshallah, we'll probably speak till about 8 o'clock. Then after that, Inshallah, we'll open the floor for questions and answers. And Inshallah, we get to pass it on to Sheikh Muhammad Tim now. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Was salatu was salam Ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Allahumma allimna ma yunfa'una wa anfa'na bima allamtana wa zidna ilman ya Rabbil Alameen As always we begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending peace and blessings upon his messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and upon his family and his companions and then by asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to teach us what benefits us and to benefit us with what he teaches us and to increase all of us in knowledge. I'd also like to start by thanking not only the brothers and Sheikh Wajid who were involved in setting up this event but also all of you for coming. And especially those of you who have young children with you, and I know that school starts tomorrow, inshallah, so we're not going to, inshallah, keep you too long, bi wa ta'ala. So, acting upon the hadith in which the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said that those who people who do not thank the people, or those who do not thank others, they have not thanked Allah, azza wa jal. And we thank all of you for coming and taking out your time here today to listen to this, and we ask Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to make it a benefit uh, to all of us. The topic of istiqamah, of standing strong and firm, standing upright, and being counted as a Muslim, stand, being firm upon the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is in reality a very, very, very vast and comprehensive topic. Because in reality, the whole of the religion of Islam, the whole concept of taqwa and the whole concept of obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and avoiding those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to avoid, all of this comes under the title of istiqamah of standing straight and standing firm upon the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's almost like being asked to talk about the entire religion of Islam. But what I wanted to talk about specifically is a set of ayat in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes istiqamah 
describes standing firm on the religion of Allah and describes what the reward is for standing firm upon the religion of Allah. And then bi-idhnillahi ta'ala, what I'd like to do is to break down these ayat into sort of issues that we can deal with for us to understand what it means to be firm upon the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what it entails for us to say that we are from these people, how we actually go about achieving that, and then finally what the benefits and the rewards and the, and the sort of outcome that we expect for standing firm upon the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا رَبُّنَ اللَّهُ, ربنا الله ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُوا تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed those people who say, Our Lord is Allah, and then they have istiqamah. And we're going to come to talk about istiqamah and what it means. But they stand, they stand upright, they stand firm. They stand up and they are counted as Muslims. You know the phrase in English we say to stand up and be counted. You know, to actually say that this is my religion and I'm sticking to it and I'm remaining firm upon it. This is all part of istiqamah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't begin the ayah by talking about istiqamah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins by talking about something which is a must if we are going to even achieve or even hope to achieve to stand firm upon the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the statement, Rabbun Allah, our Lord is Allah. Inna alladheena qalu, Rabbun Allah. Those people who say our Lord is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those people who make their religion for Allah azza wa jal alone. Those people who achieve the reality of Tawheed. They implement Tawheed in their lives. They implement the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and they don't associate anyone in worship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the ayah and it is the most important thing when we come to talk about istiqamah. And in a moment we'll talk about how Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when he was asked to define what it means to stand straight upon the religion of Allah, he said that it means that you do not associate anyone in partners with him. That is because when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu looked at the issue of istiqamah, he looked at the most fundamental thing in the whole topic, the most important thing, the thing which forms a basis for the whole concept of standing straight upon the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That everything to do with standing firm upon the religion, everything to do with standing up and being counted as a Muslim, all of it comes back to Tawheed. The beginning and the end of it is Tawheed. And that is why when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was asked to define istiqamah, he said it means that you do not associate anyone in worship with Allah azza wa jal. That's because our standing straight upon Islam, our following the prohibition, uh, following the commands and avoiding the prohibitions and our doing as much as we can to obey Allah and keeping away from as many areas that we can that Allah has forbidden us from doing, all of this is useless unless we have Tawheed, unless we have this concept of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, unless we have this aqidah which is clean, which is pure, this belief which is taken from the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the explanation of the companions and the actions of the companions. And this belief, if we don't have it, there is no benefit and there is no good in the, in the good deeds that we do after that and the standing upon the religion that we do after that. Because none of it counts unless this belief is pure in the first place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept the deeds that are done for other than his sake. And we know in the famous hadith, in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the hadith Qudusi, in which Allah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, narrates from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I have the shuraka and shirk. I am the least in need of any of those who are made partners with me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no need of the shirk that you do with him, no need of the partners that you associate with him, no need of the deeds that are done for other than his sake. And he said, and he continues to say, that whoever associates with me something, I abandon him and I abandon the shirk that he makes. So there is no benefit to your deeds, there is no benefit to your hajj and your salah and your fasting and so on and so forth if it doesn't come with the right aqidah, if it doesn't come with tawheed and it isn't for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And likewise, there is no benefit to an action if it is not in accordance with the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
Because those deeds that are not in accordance with the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam will not be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa taala. As the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us that whoever man amila amala laysa alayhi amruna fa huwa rad. Whoever does an action which is not in accordance with what I have brought, with the Sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, will not have it accepted from them. It will be rejected. So we have to understand that our discussion about standing firm upon the religion of Allah and our discussion about being standing up and being counted as a Muslim and being proud and being happy to be and being content with the religion of Islam and being happy to stand up and be counted as a Muslim upon the religion of Islam, upon the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it has to start with the correct aqeedah. It has to start, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inna ladina qalu, Rabbuna Allah, thumma staqamu. Those people who say our Lord is Allah, and then after that, after they have corrected their aqeedah, and after they are upon the belief of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions, after that they remain firm and they remain strong. From another angle, the importance of aqeedah in a standing firm upon the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shown to us from another angle. And that is the fact that our aqeedah, our belief, and our saying la ilaha illallah is not something that resides here and then stops. It is not something that resides in the heart and then it ceases. It is something that begins in the heart and then it is affirmed by the tongue and the limbs. And this is part of our belief as Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah. As the people of the Sunnah, the people who follow the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That it's not enough for you to simply say, I believe. I've believed that Allah is my Lord and I believe that there's nobody worthy of worship except Him. This belief is something, but it has to be, there has to be some tasdiq, there has to be some truthfulness that comes from the limbs. You have to show, your, your tongue and your limbs have to show the truthfulness of what you believe. And in reality, there is a link. Like Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyat rahimahullah said, there is a talazum, there is a link between the apparent nature of someone and the inner nature of someone. You can't say that I am a person that is purely upon the aqeedah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah and I completely believe in all of the tenets of Islam and all of the parts of Islam and then have nothing in your actions which gives truth to that statement. Your actions have to have some truth to, 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 to what you believe in. And so you can't find somebody who is purely evil in action whose heart is completely pure. And you can't find somebody who is purely good in action and whose heart is completely evil. There has to be a link. Yes, there's no doubt some of us may fall short in some of our actions. And sometimes our actions may not be do justice to our belief. But there's definitely a link there. And there's definitely a, a problem in someone's iman and someone's aqeed and someone's belief if their actions are completely evil, or if their actions are mostly evil, or if they find they spend most of their time in the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the least of their time they spend upholding the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this shows that there's something wrong in here to start with. And the heart is not completely pure, because the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us, in nafil jasadi mu'allah, in the, in the body there is a piece of flesh. If it is correct, the whole body was, is correct. And if it is corrupt, the whole body will be corrupt. Indeed, it is the heart. It is the heart. So when the heart is correct, the rest of the body will follow and will become correct. That's why whenever we begin by talking about standing firm and being firm upon the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, standing up and being counted as a Muslim, we have to begin by talking about what we believe. We have to begin by correcting the heart. Because if the heart is correct, by nature your actions will follow. And if you find your actions to be deficient, then know there is something in here that is wrong. So from both of those angles that we look at, we need to focus on our belief, on our statement of La ilaha illallah, on our implementation of La ilaha illallah, before we look at anything else. And that is why, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala precedes his discussion or his mention of standing firm upon the religion of Allah with the statement, Inna ladina qalu, Rabbuna Allahu thumma stakhamu. Those people who say our Lord is Allah and then they remain firm upon the religion of Allah Azza wa Jal. 
from the two sides that we looked at first of all that our actions will not be accepted unless they are sincerely for Allah and in accordance with the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and secondly that there is a link between our heart and between our outer actions our aqidah is not simply what remains in the heart our iman is not simply what remains in the heart but there must be something in the actions and something on the tongue which confirms and goes along with what we believe in our heart so when we look at this in terms of La ilaha illallah, we find that La ilaha illallah has conditions. It's not enough for you simply to say La ilaha illallah and then simply to continue. But you must, in saying La ilaha illallah, there are conditions to have. And this is a clear demonstration of why we have to focus on our aqidah before we focus on anything else. And as the poet said, and it's a very nice sort of short piece of poetry for people who who have learned the Arabic language, he said, He summarized all of the conditions for La ilaha illallah, rahimahullah, in a single sort of stanza of poetry, in which he said, knowledge, al-ilm, wal yaqeen, to be certain, wal qabul, for you to accept what it entails, well, in qiyad, for you to submit yourself to it completely, for you to enter into Islam completely. فَدْرِ مَا أَقُولُ وَالصِّدْكُ وَالْإِخْلَاصُ وَالْمَحَبَّةِ That you're truthful in what you say, that you're sincere towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in what you do, and that the guiding factor in you doing all of these things is the love of Allah azza wa jal. And this is just a brief discussion of why it's important that we don't just say la ilaha illallah, that we don't just simply say that I, I follow the sunnah, I'm upon the sunnah, I, I don't worship anything besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that your actions have to accompany this. And this is the first and the most important part of standing upright upon the religion of Allah azza wa jal. And part of this is that you enter into Islam completely, al qiyad This is a condition of la ilaha illallah, that you don't just pick and choose the bits of Islam that you like or the bits of Islam that suit you or the bits of Islam that are sort of convenient to the society that you live in, you enter into Islam completely. As Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, udukhulu fi silmi kafa. O you who believe, enter into Islam completely. Take everything in Islam and implement everything in Islam. It's not for us to pick and choose. And this also follows on as being a key part of standing firm upon the religion of Allah Azza wa Jal, that when we stand firm upon the religion of Allah, this is us entering into Islam completely. Taking every part of Islam, not simply saying this part of Islam, it doesn't suit me. This part of Islam goes against my culture. This part of Islam goes against my madhab. This part of Islam goes against my, what my shaykh told me or what my mom told me or what my dad told me. You enter into Islam completely. You submit to Islam completely. You submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every single way. And this is part of you saying la ilaha illallah. And we know that this is what follows is that you implement the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us it's not for a believing man or a believing woman if Allah and His Messenger decree something that they should have any opinion in the matter. And they should submit with complete submission. So it's not for us to pick and choose. And it's not for us to implement bits of Islam and not others. We have to try to implement everything in Islam that we can possibly implement. And again, this is from the essence of istiqamah, from the basic points of standing firm upon the religion of Allah Azza wa Jal. In terms of saying this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our Lord, this entails something. There is something more in this than just simply believing that Allah Azza wa Jal is the creator, the Lord of the universe, and the sustainer, and the provider. And that is that our worship is sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And that's why the first, first thing that we have to look at when we look at La ilaha illallah is disbelief in everything that is worship besides Allah and worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions disbelief in everything besides Allah before he mentions belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah فَمَنْ يَكْفُرْ بِالطَّاغُوتِ وَيُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ اسْتَمْسَكَ بِالْعُرْوَةِ الْوُثْقَى Whoever disbelieves in everything that is worshipped besides Allah and believes in Allah has grabbed hold of the most trustworthy handhold that will never break. <coughs> so this is why our first thing in istiqamah, the first thing that we look at when we're looking at standing firm upon the religion of Islam is that our religion is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And we have not made a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in anything. So we don't call upon the living and we don't call upon the dead and we don't call upon 
the trees or the stars or the moon for those things that Allah Azzawajal alone can do. We don't subhanAllah call upon any of these things. We disbelieve in everything that is worship besides Allah and we believe in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So this is the most important thing and the first thing a person should look at themselves before they even start to look at the quality of their prayer, before they even start to look at whether they're doing optional deeds or whether they're doing the obligatory deeds, before everything and in front of everything, they make sure that their religion is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And there are many, many, many ahadith that we can talk about in this regard. And it is enough for us to talk about the hadith which is known as the hadith of the bitaqah, the hadith of the card, when the person came come on the Day of Judgment and he sees 99 scrolls as far as the eye can see, full of his evil deeds. And he goes, they, these are put on the, on, the, on the side of the scales and he looks and he says, Oh my Lord, I don't have anything else. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him to look again and he finds a small, you know, sort of piece of paper or a small card, a bitaqa, written on it, La ilaha illallah. And he says, Oh my Lord, what is this going to do against these scrolls? What is this La ilaha illallah going to do against all of this evil that I've done? 99 scrolls stretched as far as the eye can see, just full of his bad deeds. What is this La ilaha illallah going to do? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands that it is weighed on the side of the scales, and then La ilaha illallah outweighs all of the evil deeds that he did. So before we even go on to talk about the good deeds and the bad deeds, and, and following the good and avoiding the bad, we have to get this point Right, we have to focus upon this point that our religion is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and that we have not, we have completely cleaned ourselves of any form of worship directed towards anyone other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're not giving the rights of anyone, uh, of Allah to anyone or anything else. Then if we come to the issue of istiqama, thumma istiqamu. So we've talked about what it means to say that my Lord is Allah and the importance of aqeedah and the importance of cleaning up our actions from shirk. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ استقاموا. Then they stand firm, they stand straight. Istiqama in the Arabic language means al-istiwa wal-i'tidal. It means al-istiwa wal-i'tidal. And al-istiwa wal-i'tidal in English basically means that you sort of rise up, you stand up and you stand straight. You stand straight and you stand firm. This is sort of the meaning of uh, al-istiwa or al-i'tidal in Arabic. In terms of what al-istiqama actually means for us as Muslims in the Sharia, then some of the ulama defined al-istiqama as luzum al-sirat al-mustaqim, sticking to the sirat al-mustaqim, sticking firm to the sirat al-mustaqim. And some of them continue with many other definitions, and we're going to mention some of them. But it is this definition is honestly, if you go away with nothing except this, this is inshallah enough for you to understand what it means to stand firm as a Muslim. To stick absolutely to the Sirat al Mustaqim. To stick firmly to the Sirat al Mustaqim. What is this Sirat al Mustaqim that we're commanded to stick firmly to? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith of Al Nawas ibn Sam'an, Allah has given the example of a straight path. On the two sides of this Sirat al Mustaqim, this straight path, there are two walls covered in doorways. <coughs> and on these doorways, there are curtains that are lowered down. So imagine with me for a second. We have the straight path. And on the side of this straight path, there are two walls that run alongside the straight path. In each of the walls, all the way along, there are doorways, and each of these doorways are covered with a curtain that lowered down to the ground. On the gate of this path, at the beginning of this path, right at the beginning, there is a caller saying, oh people, go upon the straight path and don't divide. Don't look left, don't look right. Carry on on this straight path. Don't look to your left and don't look to your right. Stick to this straight path. And there is another caller calling from above the path who says when a person wants to go to any of these doors and he's about to lift up the curtain, woe to you, way hack. Don't you, don't open this door, don't go into this door, because if you open up this curtain, you're going to go inside. And then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he explained what this, what this example means. So we have a straight path, we have the walls, and we have the doors, and the doors are covered by curtains. And when someone comes to lift up the curtain, it is shouted to him, Wayhak, woe to you. Don't lift up this curtain, because if you do, you're going to go inside. 
The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the straight path is Islam. The straight path is Islam. And the two walls are the hudud of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The limits that have been set by Allah. Allah's limits that he has set. That the limits of the halal and the haram. And we know the famous hadith that the halal is clear and the haram is clear. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the halal clear and the haram clear. So these two walls are the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the open doors lead to what Allah has made haram. The caller who is at the beginning of the path is the book of Allah. And the caller who calls from above the path is Allah's admonition that remains in the heart of every Muslim. And the basic nature of a Muslim or, the, or what they have learned from Islam, what they have been taught, the wa'id that remains in the heart, the inclination that Allah has put in your heart that calls you, don't do this. Don't do this haram, this is not good for you. This haram is gonna lead you away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and from the people of those people who listen to that and from the people of those people who listen to their soul's desires and they listen to the calling of the shaitan and they enter the door and so they enter into what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram. So this example is really, really a comprehensive and a detailed example which shows you exactly what is meant by sticking to the straight path. Sticking to the sirat al-mustaqeem. Not looking left, not looking right, not going into any of those doors which contain the haram which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram for you. Which you have been told either in the Quran by the book of Allah and as a sort of contained within that the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then what you or what you even know. Like the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, istafti qalbak. And the meaning of this hadith, ask your heart, is not that you put all of the fiqh of Islam down to whether you like it or not, or what your heart says. But there are certain times when you know that something is wrong. You feel that it's wrong. You, something is calling you in your mind and saying, don't do this, this is not good for you, Ya Abdullah. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in the heart of every believer. And those who listen to it, listen to it. And those who turn away from it, they turn away from it. So it is what? Luzum as sirat al mustaqim Sticking to the straight path. In how do we stick to the straight path? By sticking to that which Allah has commanded us. And what Allah has commanded us doesn't just mean the things which are wajib upon us. The things which Allah has commanded us, Allah has commanded us those things which are obligatory. And those things which are highly recommended. And those things which are recommended. All of these things are the things that Allah has commanded us. But we know what? We know that we can't come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without the obligatory deeds. And once we've got the obligatory deeds, it is then that we need to add the optional deeds in there. So following the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala involves following what Allah has made obligatory and it involves following those things which Allah has made highly recommended and those things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has recommended. All of these are the commands of Allah. Likewise, ijtinab and nahi. Keeping away from those things which Allah has prohibited means first and foremost to keep away from the haram. First, before anything, to keep away from the major sins, those sins which Allah has promised His curse or the hellfire or His anger or so on and so forth for the ones who do it. And then to keep away from the smaller sins because we know that continuing upon a small sin is like a major sin. When you continue upon a small sin time after time after time and you don't give any thought to it and you don't care that you're doing it, then this is not a small sin in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then keeping away from even the things that Allah dislikes, that is not haram for you, but Allah dislikes them. And even the things that is just not recommended for you to do, even keeping away from wasting your time with the mubahat, keeping away from wasting your time with the things that are completely halal for you, such as the one who goes and he spends all his time playing computer games. There's a time for everything. There's a time for a little bit of play. There's a time for taking a break, there's a time for learning, there's a time for other things. But when we start to become completely obsessed with the things that Allah has made halal, and we don't give any time to our ibadah or any time to our optional deeds, and we do the bare minimum, we pray our five fard salah a day and we fast Ramadan and that's it. We want to be like the Bedouin who said, Oh Messenger of Allah, by Allah, I'm not going to do anything other than these things. But instead we should be aiming for something we should be aiming for something higher. We should be aiming even to avoid the halal things that are wasting our time. Avoid them excessively. 
Like people who are addicted to shopping, every day they're out in the shopping mall going from here to there. First of all, this can contain a lot of haram, but even if we said it didn't contain any haram, and even if they didn't look at anything haram or they didn't hear anything haram, this idea of even leaving the things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made permissible to you in order for you to spend more of your time doing the things which Allah has commanded you to do from the obligatory deeds and from the optional deeds. So this is the first part. Then, sticking wal wuquf عند الحد Sticking to the limits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set. Because we all know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set limits. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, Tilka hudud Allah, tilka hudud Allah, these are the limits of Allah. فلا تعتدوها, فلا تقربوها. Don't go beyond them. Don't go beyond the limits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set. Don't come near to the limits that are going to push you into the haram. And then the, the, the scholars who define this istiqamah, they said it means to stick to the sirat al mustaqim by doing everything that Allah has commanded you and avoiding everything that Allah has forbidden you and sticking to within the limits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set. Be ilmin wa ikhlasin wa tiba' with knowledge. Because you can't do anything without knowledge. Knowledge has to come before statement and action. As Al Imam al Bukhari made in his chapter title, the chapter that knowledge precedes statement and action. And then he mentioned the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَعْلَمْ Know, O Messenger of Allah, that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah, and then seek forgiveness for your sins. So knowledge has to precede action, uh, it has to precede statement and action. And ikhlas, when we're doing all of these things, we're not doing it because our parents are going to tell us if we don't do it, we're going to get in trouble. We're not doing it so that the people think that we're upon piety, so that the people think good of us. We are doing these things, we're sticking to the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala solely to seek the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wattiba, and you have to follow the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in doing this. So we repeat the definition one more time, the definition of istiqamah. That you stick to Allah's straight path by doing what Allah has commanded you and keeping away from what Allah has forbidden you and sticking to Allah's limits with knowledge, with sincerity for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by following the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so in reality, our istiqamah is to do with what we believe, it's to do with what we say, it's to do with how we act, and it's to do with our state, the state that we're in. And it's something which is, you know, that, that your, so that your, your knowledge is right in the first place, your belief is right in the first place, your actions remain constant upon the truth, your actions remain constant upon following the sunnah, and in, you are in a state of sincerity the whole time. This is another way, another way that some of the ulama described istiqamah. They said that your sayings remain constantly upon the truth, that your actions remain constant upon following the sunnah, and that your state remains constant upon being sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So this istiqamah in reality is the whole of the religion of Islam. When you speak, you speak the truth. When you act, your action is in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When you look at yourself, you see that your actions and your speech and your belief and everything that you do is sincerely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. I mentioned that they asked Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, well Abu Bakr mentioned the definition of istiqamah and he said not to associate anything in worship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn Rajab rahimahullah, he says the essence of istiqamah is for the heart to be firm upon tawheed. Because if the heart is firm upon Tawheed, all of the limbs will be firm upon obedience of Al-Aziz Al-Hamid. Ibn Rajab has this beautiful statement when he says, the essence, the asal, the fundamental principle of istiqamah is for the heart to be firm upon Tawheed. Because if the heart is firm upon Tawheed, all of the limbs will be firm upon obedience of Al-Aziz Al-Hamid. How can you stop yourself from doing sins? How can you be strong upon the religion when your heart is sick and your heart is corrupt. So we mention from this the hadith of uh, the, the piece of flesh in the body, that if it is correct, the whole body is correct, and if it is corrupt, the whole body is corrupt, and it is the heart. When they asked Umar radiallahu an, about istiqamah, Umar mentioned about istiqamah, it is to remain firm upon obedience to Allah and not to 
not to belie this. The, the expression used is a very difficult expression to translate into English. But not to belie it with your actions. Not to let your actions and your statements go against this principle. You remain firm in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you don't move this way and that. You don't try to, you know, you don't say with your tongue what goes against that. And you don't do in your actions what goes against it. You avoid going to extremes in the religion. On one way or another. Because extremes, whether you are deficient or whether you are exaggerating something in the religion both of these extremes lead people away from the path of Allah and they lead people away from istiqam you can't have this istiqam and this standing straight upon the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you are extreme in something or if you are deficient in something you have to find that middle path they asked Uthman radiallahu anhu about istiqama he said istiqama is achieving sincerity in our actions for Allah azza wa jal alone to, they asked Ali radiallahu an about istiqamah and he said it is to perform the obligatory actions of Islam. Why did Ali radiallahu an mention the obligatory actions of Islam? Why didn't he say istiqamah is that you do everything that you can do? Because as a Muslim we start with the obligatory actions. Let me give you an example of the brother who's just starting to pray. Maybe his brother hasn't been praying and he's just going to start to pray. And so he puts upon himself that he's going to pray every single prayer. Tahajjud and two rak'ah before Fajr and then he's going to pray Salatul Duha and then he's going to pray a Salah after he makes Wudu and he's going to pray 18 rak'ah for Salatul Isha or 17 rak'ah for Salatul Isha and he's going to pray and he's going to pray and he's going to pray. How long do you think this brother is going to last? A day, two days, a week before he gives up prayer completely? And again, except who Allah has mercy upon. But this is the norm when it comes to people because they set themselves a goal that is far, 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 far too high. And they try to do all of the optional deeds all together, even though they have just begun and they have not been doing the obligatory deeds. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the hadith, which the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrated from him, right. I will declare war against the one who shows hostility to a pious worshipper of mine. The most beloved things which with, my slave, with which my slave comes near to me are those things which I have made obligatory upon him. And my slave keeps on coming closer to me by performing the nawafil, by performing the optional deeds. So it has to begin with the obligatory deeds. It has to begin by, the brother says, right, I'm going to start by praying five fard salah every single day. And when I've been doing that for a time, I'm going to add in my two raka'ah before fajr and my witr. Or maybe he starts with those. And he's just, he just keeps that for a time until he becomes firm and strong and it becomes easy for him. And he says, I can do more. And so he takes a step up and he does the rawatib, the salah, which the Messenger of Allah, 12 raka'ah, which the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam promised paradise for the one who prays them. So he prays four before dhuhr and he prays two after dhuhr. He prays two after maghrib and two after isha, along with his fajr and his witr. And then again, he takes a step up and says, I can do more. So he begins to perform some of the optional prayers. Maybe he adds in the tahajjud. Maybe he adds in salatul duha. Maybe he adds in some raka'at before asr. Or he adds in two raka'at before maghrib. And so on and so forth. He builds up what he can do. But he starts with the obligatory deeds. And that's why when they asked Ali radiallahu an about al-istiqamah, he said it is to perform the obligatory actions of Islam. Because those are the ones that you're going to be taken account to. Those are the ones that you are going to be called to account to. Like the Bedouin who came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he asked about the prayers and when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him five prayers in every day and night and he said, O Messenger of Allah, هَلْ alayya غَيْرُهُنْ Do I have to do any other prayers other than these? And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, لَا إِلَّا أَنْ تَتَوَّعَ No, unless you want to do so voluntarily. Unless you want to do so voluntarily. So we begin with the obligatory deeds and then we build our way up. So how do we go on to achieve istiqamah practically? How do we go on now that we've looked at correcting our aqidah, now that we've understood what it means to stick to the sirat al-mustaqeem, in, in obeying Allah, in avoiding what Allah forbid us, in sticking to the limits set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having knowledge, sincerity for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, following the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah. How do we then go on sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How do we go on to actually achieve this? The first thing that we need to do is to seek refuge and seek help from Allah Azza wa Jal. And to realize that we cannot achieve anything in our lives, anything at all, without the help of Allah Azza wa Jal. Without the help of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, there's no way for us to remain strong upon Islam, not me and not you. 
None of us can remain strong upon Islam without the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Trusting in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, putting our trust in Allah, doing the things that Allah has legislated us for, to, for us to do, but trusting in Allah azza wa jal. I mentioned in my last khutbah, and I think this is a useful point to mention here, that people, when it comes to this, they fall into two extremes. And we said that extremes don't go with istiqamah. You can't stand straight upon the religion of Allah if you have any extreme, either you're negligent or either you're excessive. You have to be in the middle. You have to take the middle path. In some, some people, they become so completely focused upon worldly reasons for things happening. So you see a brother in a job and he says, you know what it is, I can't come to the masjid because I have to work more and more and more. I can't afford things. I need more money. So I'm not going to come to the masjid for my salah. I'm going to work and work and work. This is someone who's come so focused on worldly things. He thinks the only way that he's ever going to achieve money is through these worldly things. The more hours he works, the more money he's going to get. And the more money he's going to get, the more rich he's going to be. And then after that, he'll think about Islam. This is one form of being excessive. On the other side, there are those people who don't do the things that they're commanded to do. So he sits at home and says, if Allah wanted, he would send down risk to me. If Allah wanted, it would come to me. But we avoid these two things and we take a middle path. So we believe that all of these worldly causes are nothing but worldly causes. They're nothing that are going to, at the end of the day, they're not the real reason behind things happening. These are just worldly things that Allah has created as a means for us to achieve something. So yes, we do them. Yes, we work to earn money. Yes, we get married to have children. But we realize when all of these things, doing all of these things, that they, we will only be successful with tawfiq, with help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't help us, then we will not be able to be successful no matter how many of worldly ways we follow. How many people they spend their whole lives moving left and right, going here and there in halal and haram looking to earn money. But they don't get it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't decreed it for them. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't make it easy for you to do this, then you will not be able to do it. So this is the first point of realization that you have to have. We said about the importance of sticking to the middle path. Whenever you go to an extreme in one way or another, you're leading yourself off into misguidance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا Like this we have made you a middle ummah. And some of the scholars of tafsir, they explain this middle ummah by the fact that we are an ummah that is just. An ummah that is exactly in its place. We don't go to an extreme in one way and we we're not deficient in the other. We stick ourselves to the middle path, right in the middle. So we don't go to extremities here and there. So extremities are not going to make you uh, have this standing straight upon the religion of Allah, have this istiqam. Because this, for example, we have the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, the religion is ease, and no one will make the religion difficult except that it overcomes him. So when you start to, you know, sort to try to make things difficult for yourselves, and you try to sort of go to extremes, and you try to follow other than the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This leads to misguidance. On the other side, when you start to make everything an excuse, everything has to be easy, and you're not interested in whether it's according to the sunnah or not, and you're looking what they call, you know, tatabur ruhas, you're looking one way or another for an easy way out. Just give me something that I can do here and here. Find me some sheikh who says it's permissible for me to have a mortgage. Find me somebody who says that it's permissible for me to do this. Find me someone who says it's permissible for me to talk to women on forums and so on and so forth. And if I find somebody, inshallah, that's enough for me. I'm not interested on in whether this is the truth or not. You can't achieve istiqamah not like that and not like this. You have to be in the middle. So we don't make the religion excessively hard for ourselves. And likewise, we don't try to find ways out, ways around here ways around the religion, left and right. But we stick firm to the middle path. This is the most important thing. The next thing in istiqamah is to realize you will not achieve it 100%. You will not, no matter how hard you try. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam promised us you will not achieve this istiqamah 100%. In the hadith narrated by Imam al-Bukhari, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, stick, stick firm to the religion of Allah. Stuck in, stick, you know, have istiqamah. Be, be firm upon the religion of Allah. And you will not be able to do it completely. Stick firm to the religion of Allah and know that you will not be able to do it completely. And then the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continued and said, and know that the best of your actions is the prayer and none remains in a state of wudu except a believer. So he said, stick, be firm, have istiqamah. 
be firm upon the religion, stand up straight, be counted as a Muslim, well enter. So you will not be able to achieve it 100%. You're not going to get it right all of the time. But the most important of the actions is the prayer. And the prayer is after our aqidah and our belief in La ilaha illallah and freeing ourselves from shirk, there is nothing that is going to give us istiqamah like the prayer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the prayer forbids us from immorality and evil doing. The prayer forbids us from immorality and evil doing. And that's why, subhanAllah, the Messenger of Allah in this hadith, stick firm to the religion of Allah, stand up upon the religion of Allah, be firm upon the religion of Allah. No, you will not achieve it 100%. The most important of your actions is the prayer. The most important of your actions is the prayer. These are hadith. It's not unrelated. It's not like a random sentence that one has just come from here and one has come from there. They are related together. So know that you're not going to achieve 100%. If you fall short, make sure you focus upon the prayer. And in Sahih Muslim, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Saddidu wa qaribu. Saddidu, that is again another term for istiqama. That, you know, be, be firm, be, be, be upon the right path. Be firm upon the right path. Stand up upon the right path. وَقَارِبُوا and come close to it. You won't be able, again this is another sign that you won't be able to achieve it 100%. You won't get it 100% of the time in 100% of the way. You're going to at some time fall short here or there. And know that none of you will be saved by your actions. They said not even you or Messenger of Allah. He said not even me unless Allah covers me in His mercy and grace. So this is again realization that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate source of success. That you're not going to get it right 100% of the time, but that you're striving to obey Allah in as much of the things as you can. And you're striving to avoid what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram for you and has made disliked for you. You're striving in that at the end of the day. That's the, that's the thing that you have to do. But you won't be saved by it. You're not going to enter Jannah by this. You're going to need the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah knows who is going to deserve it. So when you work hard, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides you to that which is going to earn you His mercy. And when you refrain from working hard and you sit down and you, you, know, you cross your hands and you say, that's it, I don't, if Allah wanted to guide me, He would have guided me. There's no doubt if Allah wanted to guide you, He would have guided you. But you sitting down in this way is earning you the wrath of Allah and the anger of Allah and is guaranteeing for you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not guide you. And you're striving in this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows those who deserve or those who will be thankful and those who will be grateful for the mercy that He's given them, and those who strive hard, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides them to His path. As Allah Azza wa Jalla says, those who strive hard in our way, we guide them. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, that those who strive in, in His way, He guides them to His straight path, or He guides them to the path of guidance. So by us striving and working hard, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us that which will earn us or which will gain us his mercy in the end. Beginning with easy actions, beginning with small things, making things easy upon yourself. Don't try to go from zero to 100% in a day. At the same time, don't, don't ever deliberately continue with a haram and don't ever deliberately continue leaving off something that is obligatory upon you. But at the same time as having said that, try not to dump lots of things upon yourself. For example, when it comes to reading the Qur'an, how many of us go in fits and spurts? We say when it comes to reading the Qur'an, we begin and we say, you know, I'm going to, you know, sort of the hare and the tortoise type example. One person, he says, I, I can read three juz a day. So for a week, he reads three juz. Or for a day, he reads three juz. Or two days, he reads three juz. One person says, I'm just going to read one page a day. One half a page a day. One ayah a day. And this person finishes the Qur'an again and again and again and again in their life. Once a year, once every six months, once every three months, once a month, once a week, again and again and again, this person is just finishing the Qur'an. And the one who's doing it in fits and spurts, maybe he finished the Qur'an once, maybe he never even finished the Qur'an ever. So we have to begin with the small deeds, small deeds. At the same time, we don't need to, as I said, we don't continue deliberately upon a haram. We have to make tawbah as soon as we realize that we're doing something haram. And likewise, we don't deliberately leave off of a good deed or leave off of an obligatory deed. But at the end of the day, when it comes to the optional deeds, small and steady, slow and steady is more important. And we know that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that the actions which are small and regular are more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than those which are large 
if and done infrequently. So small, frequent and regular actions. I think it's important that we talk about the hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the next few minutes in which he said لا تحفرن من المعروف شيئا Don't look down on any of the good deeds that you do. Don't think that anything is too insignificant. You know I'm not doing enough, it's only this, it's only a small thing. And Al-Hafid ibn Hajari has a beautiful ta'aliq, a beautiful commentary on this hadith in which Al-Hafid ibn Hajari says that this is because a believer doesn't know which good deed will be the reason for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon him nor does he know which bad deed will be a reason for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's anger to fall upon him. This is a very, very, very beautiful commentary by Al-Hafid ibn Hajar rahimahullah about this hadith. He says, the reason that you don't look down on any good deed, you don't say, this deed is not, I don't need to do this, this is just too insignificant. You know, subhanAllah, this deed is not worthy of me, I'm going to focus on bigger and better things. But subhanAllah, you don't know which good deed is going to be the cause for Allah's mercy, and you don't know which evil deed is going to be the cause for Allah's anger. So you strive to do as many of the good as you can, and to keep away from as much of the evil as you can. It's very important that you know your weaknesses. And you know the way that the shaitan gets control over you. So you know that, for example, it may be that a brother says, the shaitan gets control over me with, I don't know, the internet, for example. And I always find myself, whenever I'm on the internet, I'm, I'm going to something haram, I end up listening to something haram or watching something haram. If a person knows this is how the shaitan gets to you, you need to cut off that way that the shaitan gets to you. A person says, I know the shaitan gets to me through the fitna of women. So don't make yourself responsible for the sister's side of the masjid, for example, yeah? That if you know that the shaitan gets to you in this way, and you know this is how the shaitan afflicts your heart, don't put yourself in a position that's going to let the shaitan control you. Don't put yourself in a position that's going to give the shaitan an opportunity to call you to this harm. Everybody can look at themselves and say, I know a means and a way where the shaitan gets to me. When I look at what the haram that I do, I find it's usually in this area or in this area or in this area. And you can cut off the ways to that haram. And when you know the way that the shaitan gets control over you, you know how to beat him. Just like when you know how your enemy is going to attack you in a war, you know the enemy is going to come from this mountain over the top, you can put your guards and you can put your soldiers on that line so the enemy is not able to breach the front line. Likewise, when you know how the shaitan attacks you, you can put blocks and you can put walls there so that the shaitan is not able to attack you. But you have to be clever about it and you have to think how has the shaitan overcome me in the past? Maybe some, some, some brothers, it's to do with money, it's to do with riba, it's to do with gambling. It can be any one of these kind of things that you know the shaitan gets to me like this. And so you avoid the, this particular thing and you make double the effort to avoid it. A couple more things, inshallah, before we finish very, very briefly. The importance of good friends. For you to have this istiqama and to stand straight upon the religion of Allah Azza wa Jal, it is critical, absolutely critical, that you have good friends. That you have good friends who help you in it. And if you look at many, many people who are not sticking upon the religion of Allah, not standing straight upon the religion of Allah, one of the primary things you can see in each one of them is that they don't have a good circle of friends. And there are many, many ahadith, there are too many ahadith to even mention about the importance of good friends and the importance of you know, knowing that it doesn't matter who is with you. It doesn't matter about the number of people. It doesn't matter if people sort of, you know, uh, in school, people don't talk about you very good or people don't look at you very good because you stand upon, straight upon the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah azza wa is with you and if the friends that you have, no matter how few they are, are strong upon the religion of Allah azza wa then for the most part, a person will be successful. So good friends is very, very important and keeping away from bad people is very, very important because it is exactly like the example of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, gave of the person who has the perfume, the person who, who trades in perfume or who gives out perfume. This person, if you're friends with him, doesn't matter if he doesn't give you any perfume, you're still going to end up smelling good. And the person who's like the blacksmith is the example of the bad friend, the one who even if, you know, subhanAllah, he doesn't burn you with his tools, the bad smell of the furnace is going to come upon you. So no matter what you do, you, having good friends is critical to istiqam. Very, very, very quickly in the last minute or two, inshallah, we talk very briefly about the reward of istiqamah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ 
ألا تخاف ولا تحسن وأبشر بالجنة التي كنتم توعدون. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the angels descend upon them. Three times when the angels descend upon them. The first time, at the moment of death. Imagine how hard the moment of death, sakratul maut, the hard time of death, the pains of death, and the angels descend saying, don't worry, don't worry about what has passed, don't have any concern about what is coming, and have good tidings of Jannah that you have been promised. Imagine when you are raised out of the graves the second time, when the horn is blown for the second time and everyone is running from place to place and the sun is as close to a person and people are drowning in their own sweat and the angels come down and say, don't worry about what has passed and don't worry about what is coming and take glad tidings of a paradise which you have been promised. We are, the, we are your companions in the hayat dunya and in the akhirah. In this world and in the hereafter, we protected you, we guarded you by the command of Allah in this world, and we are with you, guiding you and helping you in the Akhirah. And you will have whatever your soul wants, and you will have whatever you or whatever what you have been promised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything that your soul desires and what you have been promised. And the third time, when the believers enter Jannah. And when they are all entering into Jannah, the angels are saying to them, the angels descend upon them saying, don't fear about what is past, don't fear about what is going to come, take the glad tidings of paradise. We were your companions in this world and in the Akhirah, and you are going to have whatever your soul desires in paradise, and you will have what you have been promised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nuzulan min ghafoorin rahim, as a favor from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nuzul in Arabic is what you prepare for a guest. When your guest comes and you prepare. And if you imagine what the, the generous people of this dunya prepare for their guests, then imagine what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepares for his guests in Jannah al Firdaus al A'la. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make you and to make us from his people. Uh, that's about all we had time for. We had to cut down as much as we could, and it's a very, very long topic. And inshallah, there's been some benefit in there for everybody. And inshallah, we'll have time for some questions. Be ibn Allah ta'ala. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shadu an la ilaha illa ant. أستغفرك وأتوب إليك. Questions, guys. The usual, the usual protocol is if anybody, any of the brothers got any questions, any sensible questions, particularly linked to the subject, then inshallah, please put your hand up and inshallah, we'll get them to ask the questions. And the sisters, inshallah, they can write their questions and send them down. We've got about ten or fifteen minutes, inshallah, be in the light. Can anybody continue to drink this in the kitchen? That comes afterwards. <laughs> in between the film. Can I, can I ask you this? What's the, uh, the reward for if somebody walking on the path of istikamah? That he, he's got trials, and he's got tested, and what's the reward for it? Okay, the brother's question is, someone who is standing upon the path, the Sirat al-Mustaqeem, he has istiqamah, he's standing firm upon the religion of Allah Azza wa Jal. And what is the, he's tried by trials and tribulations. What is the reward for this? The first reward and the most important reward is the reward which is mentioned in the ayah. The reward of paradise and the promise of paradise. Because the reality is you will not achieve this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this later on in the ayat. وَمَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا الَّذِينَ صَبَرُ You know, you will not be able to achieve this. All of these things that are mentioned, whether it relates to the things that are mentioned after or the things that are mentioned in this part of the ayah, you will not be able to achieve this except for the one who is patient. Patient in doing good, patient in keeping away from evil, and patient upon the trials and the tribulations that befall a person. And the trials and tribulations that befall a person are a reason for them to enter Jannah. Like the hadith of Uthman, uh, or the hadith about Uthman and when the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, let Uthman enter and give him glad tidings of paradise because of a fitna that will, or because of a trial or a tribulation that will befall him. And subhanAllah, the patience at the time of trial and tribulation this is the characteristic of the people of Istiqamah, the characteristic of the believers. And the rewards, subhanAllah, that are mentioned for, for the patient, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ and give glad tidings to the patient. The, the rewards for being patient at the time of trials and tribulations are, are more than we can imagine. And from the most foremost of those rewards is to being entered into paradise and having that safety and security and that glad tidings from the angels at the moment of death and at the moment of being raised from the grave and at the moment of entering into Jannah. Allah. Yeah. 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 Ye
mentioned it's actually not a question if you don't mind. No, no, but uh, you mentioned a form uh, which allows you to sort of even like memorize mm. the, the air conditions of the of the kalima, the shahada. I have a bit of a thing in English. Can I just quickly mention it if you don't mind? Yeah, if yeah. you do mention it in English. Yeah, it's yeah. Really, it really is. It's dead easy to remember the eight conditions of the Kalamar through just one, really one word. It's a company. All right, it's a company name. Um, S A C K S L T D. What does that mean? Sachs Limited. Mm. Imagine you know people who you know put dates in the Sachs and sell them and things like this here. Yeah? Sachs Limited. All right. The the first S is submission. All right. So we submit to Allah. Okay. Let me repeat it on the mic because I'm gonna the, the, so everyone can hear each other. So the brother, I'll repeat the first bit and the second bit. The brother's making a, an addition, inshallah, to help us to remember the conditions for, of La ilaha illallah in English for those who can't learn the Arabic. Uh, and he mentioned that this can be learned by memorizing or by learning a company name. And each letter will stand for one of the conditions, and that is Sachs Limited. And he said the S, submission. submission. Yeah. Okay. And the A is acceptance. All right. That we accept everything that Allah the Messenger, uh, that we have from Allah the Messenger. All right. So the A is acceptance. Okay. The C is certainty. Okay. We are certain of what we, you know, we have certainty about the, the, the deal of Allah. The C is certainty. And the K is knowledge. Okay. We have knowledge that Allah is one, and that you know the, the, we have we have knowledge of the deal of Allah. The K is knowledge. Uh, and then the, the next S, another sax. All right. The next S is sincerity. Okay. That we are a class, we, we, we sincerely, you know, uh, believe in Allah and the Messenger. And the next and S is sincerity. Uh, then there's the L, which is love. Okay, we love Allah and the Messenger, we love the deen of Allah. <coughs> the L is love. T is truthfulness. Okay, yeah. so we accept or, or we acknowledge the truthfulness of the deen of Allah. So the T is truthfulness. Truthfulness, yeah. And then the last D is disbelief, not just disbelief, Allah. disbelief in Dawood, or disbelief in anything that's that people associate with Allah. And the D is disbelief in all those things that are was uh, worshipped besides Allah Azza wa Jalla. That's a very, very beneficial point. And it's important to mention here because we mentioned the Arabic and now inshallah the brothers who find it hard to learn the Arabic can learn the English inshallah. So that's a very, very good good method. And it's the first time I've ever heard it. So mashallah, tabarakallah. Jazakallah Any more questions from the brother's side? You mentioned Tawheed. Could you briefly just tell people that don't know what Tawheed is? Okay, briefly, Tawheed. Tawheed is the verbal noun that comes from Wahadi Wahidu, which means to make something one, or to declare something to be one, or to believe something to be one. That's linguistically. So linguistically, it comes from Wahadi Wahidu, which means to make something one, or to believe something to be one. As for uh, Tawheed in the Sharia of Islam, it is the definition to believe or to affirm. To affirm is better than to say to believe. To believe and affirm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Lord, the creator, the sustainer, the provider, the one who gives life and death, the one who controls the universe, the one who decrees every single thing. To believe and affirm Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes as they have come without denying them, without changing their meaning, without uh, de without uh, applying them to, or comparing Allah azza wa jal, uh, to his creation and to take them as they've come in the Sunnah and as they've come in the Book of Allah Azza wa Jalla and upon the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and most importantly that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala is the only one deserving of worship that nothing and nobody else is deserving of worship except Him so our Salah and our <coughs> prayer and our Dua and our trust and our love and our fear is for Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala alone and nobody has any share in that other than Allah Azza wa Jalla and that is a very quick way to define Tawheed so it is Belief in all of the aspects of the things that Allah does, Allah's actions, Allah's mercy, and Allah's, uh, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala providing risk, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving life and death. And it is the belief that our actions towards Allah are for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. How does one uh, purify the heart? Purifying the heart is a long, a long, long, long topic. A long topic. But something that it's very, very, very important. I think the first thing that I would, and this is just a few things off the top of my head that I've heard from some of the Mishai and some of the scholars. One of the first things is for a person to have muhasabah to nafs, to look at themselves, to take themselves to account. Because the first thing you need to recognize is that there's a problem. And once you recognize that there's a problem, inshallah, you can rush to find the solution. So recognizing the problem is about taking yourself to account and about, you know, and sort of looking at your actions and saying, 
what can I do to be better? What am I doing that's not good enough? Where am I falling short? And part of that is some of the stuff I talked about, about knowing the way the shaitan gets at you and about trying to stick to the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But broadly, the purification of the heart comes by uh, by following the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by avoiding disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the more that you obey Allah azza wa jal, the closer you become towards purifying your heart Allah gives you purity and Allah gives you guidance and Allah makes you firm upon his religion and the more you disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the more black spots appear upon the heart until they become sealed completely so it's a, a very big topic and it has a lot, a lot of sort of sub things you can talk about a lot of tips you can talk about but broadly taking yourself to account and then trying your very best to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cut out the areas of disobedience in your life are a major part towards purifying the heart. And of course that comes with knowing Allah Azza wa Jal because until you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you won't have any reason to obey Him. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He mentions Tawheed in the Quran, He mentions two reasons for the creation of mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, jinna wal insa illa We've only created jinn and men to worship me alone. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the other in another ayah, Allah who created the seven heavens and from the earth the likes of them, seven the likes of them. He controls the affairs that go between them so that you may know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is able to do all things and that Allah has, accompanied, uh, has encompassed everything with his knowledge. So by knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this leads you to worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. When you know that Allah is your Lord and your sustainer and your provider and you know the severity of disobeying Allah and you know the importance of obeying Allah and you know Allah's punishment and you know that Allah is shadeed al-iqab and shadeed al-adab that Allah is severe in punishment and Allah is sari al-hisab and quick to take you to account and you know that Allah is the most merciful and Allah is more merciful than a child and a mother to her child and so on and so forth your knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spurs you on to worship Him alone and that's why there's no contradiction between these two ayat that mention separate reasons for the creation of Allah uh, for the creation of uh, Allah's creation of, of, uh, of mankind we've been created so that we know Allah and come to worship Him and we've created, been created to worship Allah based on our knowledge of Him so the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his names and his attributes and his lordship and his right to be worshipped this knowledge is a major part as well of purifying the heart and there are many other things that we can mention Allah. Do we have a question from the back? How long was it basically uh, that you knew that you were going to be a revert? Okay, this is a really good question. If I understand it right, how long does a revert or, or is a sort of question how long does a revert have to learn uh, uh, Okay, and how much is it accepted for them to sort of, I guess, make mistakes in the beginning and so on and so forth. There's a few things that you need to know about reverts. The first thing is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, قَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ amanna. The, the Bedouins, some reverb Bedouins into Islam, they said, we have believed. قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا Say, you have not believed. وَلَكِنْ كُونُوا أَسْلَمْنَا and say, But say, we have become Muslim. وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ And Iman has not yet entered into your heart. That shows that a revert is in a very delicate stage when they first become Muslim. They're in a stage where they might feel like they've really entered into Islam and really belief has centered into their heart and they're full of Iman. <coughs> but in the end of the day, they're very fragile because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to those Bedouins, say you have not believed, but you have become Muslim. You've taken the first step. You've affirmed what you had to affirm. You've entered Islam in the most basic sense. But you have a long, long way to go. And Iman has not yet fully entered into your heart. You haven't really entered into Iman in full. So that means that they're in a very, very delicate situation and you need to bear that in mind when you deal with the revert brothers and sisters. At the same time, as soon as the revert comes to know something in Islam, as someone who is you know, above the age of puberty, who's entered into Islam with knowledge, they are required to follow the commands of Allah and to avoid the prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as much as possible, they need to enter into Islam in the same way that a Muslim needs to enter into Islam. The difference with the revert is they may not know everything, or it may take them time to realize things. But as long as the revert can say, whenever I heard that something was obligatory on me, I did it. And whenever I learned that something was haram for me, I abstained from it, they will continue to be in a good situation. What I don't like is to give reverts a set amount of time and say, you have six months and Allah will not look at whether you fasted or not, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look at whether you prayed or not. It's not like that. You're required to pray from the very first moment that you enter into Islam. 
but you might not know all of the prayers, that you might not know how to do Al-Fatiha properly, so you may simply say a few words instead, praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, or the person says, La ilaha illallah, or they fill in the gaps with what they don't know, but they're still required to pray. Look at the Bedouin who came, or the person who came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and said that he was unable to read Al-Fatiha. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa didn't say, even though Al-Fatiha is a rukun of the prayer, the prayer is not accepted without it. He didn't say to him, okay, you don't have to pray until you learn a bit more about Islam. He said to him, no, you have to pray. And you have to instead say these few words instead. Instead of Al-Fatiha, for example. So we see that the new Muslim, yes, they will be limited in their knowledge. Yes, there will be things they can't do. But as they must try their very best to obey whatever they know is obligatory in Islam and to keep away from whatever they know is haram in Islam. Yes, there is sometimes a process and there are sometimes difficulties, but that's part of their test. There are sometimes family difficulties and problems, but a person is required to do as much as they can to obey Allah Azza wa Jal and as much as they can to avoid disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's no difference in that for someone who's just become Muslim and someone who hasn't. Briefly, you touch just for a moment upon what every Muslim needs to know. What is a reverb? What do you need to know? You begin with the five pillars of Islam, that you understand properly what it means to say that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah, that Muhammad is the Messenger of Allah, and the prayer, the zakah, the fasting and uh, the Hajj, and likewise at the same time, or perhaps even before, they begin with the six pillars of Iman, what it means to believe in Allah and His messages, His angels, His books, and to believe in the last day, and to believe in Qadr, the good of it and the bad of it. And then you need to know those things that are relevant to your life. So if you're a husband, you need to know how to treat your wife. If you're a father, you need to know how to bring up your kids. If you're a businessman, you need to know what's halal and haram in trade. But the basic knowledge that every Muslim, starting with the reverts and everybody else needs to know the five pillars of Islam, the six pillars of Iman, and then those things that are relevant to their lives as they come about. So you're a student and you're traveling, you need to know the ruling of traveling, and so on and so forth. And this, inshallah, hopefully is a short answer to the question. Allah. What's your story of becoming a Muslim? My story of becoming a Muslim, inshallah, I will tell you at a different time because it normally takes me about an hour. <laughs> but I'll give you the short, the very, very, very short version, the, the 30 second version. In the 30 second version, um, I was going through a very difficult time in my life. Uh, I was very, very troubled. I didn't have a good relationship with my parents, didn't have a good set of friends, and went to RE classes. And in my RE classes, part of the national curriculum, whenever I would hear about Islam, it would really impact me and enter into my heart. And I really felt like this is really ajeeb because I, I was rebellious against everything. I rebelled against authority, parents, teachers, everybody. You know, I was constantly getting in trouble at school. And I wanted to rebel, and I finally found something that I didn't want to rebel against, and something that I felt that was worthy of submitting to. And then I went home and I looked on the internet, and uh, you know I, I became Muslim myself, and you know on my own. And then I met some Muslim friends, and and then there was a story after that about how I you know spent a few years not really practicing Islam, sort of going from left to right, not really being able to find you know, good education in Islam and someone to help me. And also my own, you know, your own nafs, you don't blame other people, but you know, it starts with yourself. And then, you know, also the fact that I sort of, it was difficult to find the right sort of educational material to sort of bring someone up. And a revert needs that because you're like a small child, you, you need someone to raise you up upon Islam. And, you know, after that, alhamdulillah, we met with some brothers and some of them are shaykh and they had a huge impact. And then I started to practice Islam and then I went to Medina University and that's the end of the show. <laughs> but that's the, that's the 30 second version. The other version takes a lot longer. Inshallah, that's the last uh, question that we're going to take. We don't have any written questions from the sisters, inshallah. Yeah, of course you can. Exactly. First of all, I'd like to thank the Sheikh for this very illuminating and also motivating talk. Mashallah. I'm sure that we all benefited, inshallah, greatly from his talk. And inshallah, this is something that we'll go, inshallah, take away with us, inshallah, try and practice it. Inshallah, as we said before that, inshallah, now, We've had the shift two or three times, inshallah, it'll be something more regular, be the light, Allah. Um, also, I'm going to just remind you of two things, and then after that, refreshments. Now, I don't like to say refreshments when people are talking. The shaykh was answering questions, so I wasn't going to announce refreshments. Two things I'm going to mention, then you can go and have your refreshments. If you need to leave, you can leave. But please bear in mind also, if you're parked not very sensibly, then and you need to move your car for other people to get out, then move your car if you want to come back in, you can come back in. So two things I want to mention, uh, the first is that we have a talk inshallah which is going to be done by the ISOC, brother Asif is involved with the ISOC, he's the head brother there, that's going to be held on Sunday the 13th of January. So basically next Sunday, 
the time is 4.30 and it will continue to 6.30 and I'm sure it won't be a, you know, one long talk for two hours. Uh, it's going to be called Fire Without Wood, A Soul Without a Body. And apparently it's going to be a talk on Islamic manners by Ustad Abu Taymiyyah. Charles is going to be held in Teesside University, Europa Building, Room uh, OL1, Middlesbrough. So inshallah that's one of the university buildings here. Please bear that in mind. Look out for the posters, we will keep announcing it. As I, you know, I'm going to reiterate this. These events that we put on, inshallah, the, the more the brothers make an effort to come to them and bring people along to them, inshallah, the more successful they will be and inshallah encourage the brothers who are doing these events to inshallah keep doing more events. So please, you know, make every effort. Don't find excuses, you know, oh, I can't come because I've got this, I've got that. Try and put things off and prioritize. This is an opportunity to seek knowledge. Mashallah, we've learned so much today. And, uh, you know, if we didn't sit here for an hour, an hour and a half, maybe we would have sat in front of a television, most of us, or in front of a computer playing games. What would we have benefited? Nothing at all. So, alhamdulillah, you know, this is an excellent opportunity. It's an excuse to do something. And one of the things is that when you do things collectively, it makes learning easier. Collective learning makes learning easier. Because sometimes learning by itself requires motivation. When you've got somebody like Mashallah Sheikh Muhammad Tim coming and giving you, spoon feeding you the knowledge and it's done in such a nice manner, Alhamdulillah it's easy to absorb it and to assimilate it inshallah and also to act upon. That's the first event. So that's going to be Sunday the 13th of January from 4.30-6.30, fire without wood, a soul without a body which is going to be delivered by Sheikh Abu Taymiyyah. The second event is called Uniting the Hearts and it's going to be a fundraising dinner done by Aira. Uh, it's going to be presented by Sheikh Abdul Rahim Green, Al-Salah Abdul Rahim Green, who you might have known from Islam Channel Peace TV and he's been here several times as well. It's a fundraising dinner that's going to be held on the 12th of January, which is on Saturday from 6 till 9. The venue is going to be Aklam Green School, uh, in Middlesbrough. So inshallah, if anybody's interested in that, you can inshallah purchase tickets from the Zaheer. Brother Zaheer is here. Just put your hand up. So if anybody wants to purchase tickets for this charity dinner, then inshallah they can come to uh, Brother Zaheer and inshallah they can get the information for that. Finally, I'd like to thank... Oh yes. I've just been given a little poster. Uh, this, you can see the poster behind me as well. We've had a poster on the, on the noise board for uh, uh, quite some time as well. This is the next Al Maghrib course. Uh, which is going to be delivered, uh, it's called Denial and it's the Tafsir of Surah Rahman and Surah Yaseen and it's going to be inshallah delivered by uh, Dr. Dudah Abdeer uh, who mashallah is uh, quite a profound mashallah member of their team and he's mashallah a very good speaker so I really encourage all of the brothers and sisters if they can inshallah participate in that this is something which is done on a, a single weekend and um, you're required to enroll for this so this is going to be held on January the 25th and the 27th and inshallah you can speak to the Al Maghrib team that are here uh, brothers uh, put their hands up so you can inshallah come and speak to them uh, to en enroll and I think also you can enroll online so just look out for the posters for all these up and coming events finally I'd like to say Jazakallah khair to all of you mashallah everybody uh, that came out, inshallah. We would really like to, inshallah, thank them uh, for coming out and spending this time. And inshallah, please, we would really, really encourage everybody the next time you come, don't come alone. If you came this time, you came alone, bring somebody with you. Bring a friend. Because if you th think what you've heard today was good, then what you should do is you should want that for your friends, or for your relatives, or for your brother. So bring them along. And Alhamdulillah, the masjid's doors are open. Any events, any good events that anybody wants to hold, if you can just come and you know, confirm them with the, the masjid, with the people responsible, the masjid, myself, Uncle Allah, Ditta, some of the other brothers, inshallah, we'll be happy to hold these events. The events are, if we're not stated, inshallah, they're open to brothers and sisters. We accommodate for the sisters as well, as we should do. Um, so finally, Zakmullah khair to Sheikh Muhammadin for coming this far. And I keep getting told there's refreshments in the kitchen, so inshallah, anybody who wants refreshments, uh, the refreshments are in the kitchen. Really, we've had our refreshments by listening to Sheikh Muhammad Timpa. If anybody wants further the refreshments, the worldly refreshments, then inshallah they're available in the kitchen. Jazakallah khairan. Subhanakallah.